One of the things, please, is, uh, is that uh, we're seeing, we're seeing a, a, a big, please John, yeah. Um, we're seeing a tr tremendous move uh, in IoT. I, I mean, there's, uh, it is amazingly uh, growing an incredible amount. I got an email from my sprinkler system last night, for instance. But um, how important do you see that in, in Europe compared to what is growing at a tremendous rate in the US now? You, how would you say it is, say, in Portugal? So we, we see it in two different ways. So IoT inside the home and IoT outside the home. I think outside the home there is a huge opportunity in terms of business to business uh, around I, IoT. We are pursuing those, those options. Uh, inside the home, I think we as service providers need to, to have a very important role in the IoT space. And that, and that role is the fact that we have the gateway, we control the access to, to, to the home. So we can support uh, service discovery. That's very important for those type of devices that are very, very simple devices. But also we should take on the role of security. So those devices need to be as simple as possible. And we, as an operator on the network and on the gateway, need to, to deliver the security so that those devices can work correctly. Thank you, thank you. We've got two new faces, by the way. We've got Colin Phillips from BT and John Williams from Zodiac, um, who has also got a, a stunning booth outside. Um, anyway, a question for you, John. Um, uh, with, uh, with Bezos' law, Moore's law, and Nielsen's law all converging, is there any need to have anything other than a good Wi-Fi mesh system in the home and, and, uh, and a gateway? Is there any role for a set-top box of any sort? Isn't it all going to be rendered out there in the cloud? Well, <clears throat> first of all, we're a middleware company, so we, we use on some of our implementations Android and, and RDK as well as our own. Um, and uh, we've been working on a number of projects where this move to try and cloudify all of the services and push them to, uh, in our case, very commonly old CPE, so trying to you know rinse the value out of your paid assets. Um, so there's no reason why that can't continue, not only to assist um, older devices that are already in the home, as well as new ones. So offloading an awful lot of the value, or, or, or the heavy lifting into the cloud, is definitely where where we're going. I was very intrigued about the um, the HPV TV the app concept as well. That 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 sounds very ex interesting. So yeah, I think you'll start to see it, but you know, it really depends on where a particular operator is. I think we keep hearing about these operators who've got different positions. So uh, a new operator, that, of which there are many are popping up now because someone said it's very easy now, won't have legacy problems. And you can, you can start things very, very, in a very new way. Whereas the, um, I think we've heard the term dusty old cable companies have different problems. So um, you, you'll, you'll start, you'll, it'll be, you know, horses for courses, really. Yeah, so dusty old telecom companies. It's your turn. <laughs> so <laughs> so, great so, intro so like where, where are you going? I mean, you've got all these choices now. You're spoiled for choice. You've got this, this app-based thing from HBP TV. You've got RDK. You've got Android. Where's BT going to, to land? That's a really interesting question. I think we've had a lot of very good presentations today. Um, so if I can borrow the Mark Twain quote about set-top boxes. Mark Twain reading his own obituary in the newspaper, and his comment on that was, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Mm -hmm. I think the same situation probably applies for the set-top box as well. So that, that holy grail of doing away with the capital cost of set-top box and being able to provide services, I think um, operators have been looking for for a long period of time. Uh, OPAP is maybe the latest pass at this. I think it's some very interesting promise there. We'll see, um, I guess, how that gets adopted by the marketplace. I think you noted the close collaboration still required between the TV set manufacturers and the operators, and does that scale? I guess we, we shall see. Um, I think at least for, for the next few years, the, the set-top box still has a very strong place, but working very closely with other devices in the home. I think we heard this morning about some of the changes in demographic. People talk about screen ages, uh, the younger generation stuck on the small, sm small phone. People still watch premium content, even much that demographic on a large screen. So we need a mixed economy. We have set-top box and devices working seamlessly in the home. And of course, the Wi-Fi plays into that as well. So as you wander around with your mobile device in your home, it has to carry on playing without stopping. Yeah. 
So you, is that another way of saying you're not going to tell us which way you're going? <laughs> oh, well, all of them, I think. Okay. You know, we'll follow the, follow the customers. That's, what, Very that's good. what customers want to do. So um, one of the things I thought is interesting, if you examine the RDK side of things and their way they work with specific socks and also the, the kind of uh, compliance testing from Android TV, does that mean that there's going to be um, limited competition between socks? Maybe what happens if one of the... Uh, the silicon providers suddenly goes out of favor with the Department of State in, in the U.S., for instance. You know, what, how, is, is that going to happen? Is it gonna be, are we going to limit the competition by making a set-top box with, with these socks in? Do you want to answer that? Who wants to answer that? I, I guess I could, Actually, I could that's probably it. yours, Tony. Yeah, he I, buys I a lot of them. I, I, I buy a lot of socks. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, th there's been a tremendous amount of, of change in that industry as well. I mean, you know, industry consolidation, whether it be operator consolidation, manufacturer consolidation, silicon consolidation, I mean, everybody is trying to get scale in what is diminishing returns in terms of, of profitability in that space. Everybody's getting squeezed. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, I know for a fact, and without, without naming it, I mean, Android works on several different types of silicon, so does RDK. Um, however, if you look back five years, the amount of silicon that, that you could choose from versus today has obviously been quite a shift um, and a diminishing of that. And, and um, you know, I think how many do you need to be successful um, in that space? You know, we certainly don't want to just work with one. I mean, that's not healthy for, for any of us, um, regardless of where they're based or where they might relocate to. Um, that said, you know, I don't think we need a dozen either. It's just not, not healthy. And I think, you know, as an operator, you need to think very carefully about silicon selection because a lot of operators were burned when, when ST, as an example, ST Micro, got out of that business really quickly um, as well. So, you know, thinking about the longevity of your partners, um, I think, is something, is an important consideration. Um, so there's a question for the operators, unless you've got a question in the audience. Is there any questions from the audience yet? Okay, um, maybe this one will promote some. Um, the role of HDR, and especially now that this seems to be coming, uh, with the help of the Ultra HD Forum, uh, has become a little clearer the right way to implement it with their guidelines, which I think they're going to release the next version at NAB. But, um, but it doesn't seem to be taking off as much as I would have thought. Because it is, a, you know, the TVs now, it's hard to buy one that's not already 4K compliant and has all the things in necessary to do either HLG or, or PQ, whatever uh, HDR you want. What's happening, for instance, in, in England, as, uh, sorry, Britain, as, as far as HDR take up? Uh, that's a really good question. Well, I've got a couple of comments to make. So first of all, you're right. There's a lot of HDR TV sets coming to market now. Uh, but one of the things that surprises me, even nowadays, TVs still have an average of about seven year lifespan. So to get to a large addressable marketplace is going to take some period of time. But I think one of the really great things about HDR, it really has consumer appeal. You think about the transition that happened from CRT to flat screen. For your average consumer walking into a TV showroom, it was really obvious the benefit they were getting. And I think HDR is another one of those technologies. It's really immediately apparent the benefit that it brings. Um, so there will be a cycle as people replace their TVs that's the addressable market starts to grow. Uh, we've been doing considerable amounts of trialing, and we're fortunate we have a lot of sporting rights, so we can go from glass to glass. So you do have to have the whole chain together. So we can film in HDR, we can produce in HDR, we can distribute it in HDR, and then through our set-top box we can deliver to an HDR TV set. So we've done a few trials that's been pretty well received, and we should talk about advanced audio as well. Mm -hmm. We've also done those in the trialing. Um, uh, and we've also done some trials to mobile devices as well. So the, the handset manufacturers are starting to add. We saw at Mobile World Congress, uh, HDR capability to their handsets as well. So I think my view is it will be successful because it's consumer appeal, but it will be a bit of a slow burn as the CPE and the TV sets uh, reach the marketplace and we build that addressable marketplace. Okay, and given that in Holland they're crazy as, uh, as the British are about football, I almost said soccer there, football, right? <coughs> What's happening with HDR and, and 4K in, uh, in, in other you know, yeah, advanced well, audios? Yeah, I would like to comment on, uh, on uh, what Colin just said because what we see is uh, on one side we see a lot of rapid evolution on, with this 4K HDR, also HFR is coming up. Yeah. Uh, so the evolution is very quickly. But on the other side, as I said in my presentation, also we are moving functionality from the set-top box to the cloud. So that means that all the wearing parts, the hard drive, they are removed from the set-top box, which means that these set-top boxes are staying longer for the, at the customer premises. 
So it's you, a challenge to, uh, uh, yeah, to address all these customer needs, as Colin was saying. So we have a, uh, uh, an install base of set of boxes, which potentially will not support all these rapid, rapidly coming technologies. So, so Mark Twain is on his last legs in Holland, is, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, so so, uh, so it, 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 what about in, in Portugal, HDR? I mean, again, all crazy about soccer, football rather, over there. So, so when the actual problems of this new generation of chipsets that were launched two, three years ago was 4K, was a reintroduction of, of HDR. So I think the market has realized that the promise of 4K, it only works for huge big screens. So for the, for the, for the regular subscriber to take advantage of 4K, he can only take advantage of it on a huge screen on, on the main room. HDR changes things. So actually HDR delivers a huge jump in terms of the quality that we expose to, to the end user. In that sense, HDR is one of the reasons why we are also evolving to, to a current generation of socks, so a current generation that supports new standards, like, for instance, the Dolby Vision that we were uh, checking there in the presentation that were not available two or three years ago that are emerging standards right now. So yes, that's a big part of our plans. We, we intend to engage our, our consumers with new uh, offerings, new content offerings, with HDR in two specific areas, so movies and series on one side and sports on the other side. So just like you offer um, content in HDR format or SDR format, for instance, or 4K or 2K, um, are you going to offer assistance, if you like to call it, in, in, you know, as an option? You can choose your, which one you want. Alexa, press A. You know, uh, for Google Assistant, press B. Is that, is that something you consider? A future in your so that's that's very interesting. I'm I'm a firm believer that voice is the the new user interface. I think voice is a much more inclusive user interface than a graphical interface because it's <coughs> much easier for for a grandmother to actually engage through voice than through a, a graphical interface. Uh, so yes, we we do believe that's the way forward. We we are uh, in in what Anthony w was describing. We are in, in the hybrid approach in the sense that we want to to have the control of the access to the voice interface, but at the same time integrate with third parties. So we want to be in the middle so that when you, the user says, play strange things, I might have that in my catalog. So I'm the one that wants to make the decision, what's the first thing that I want to deliver to, 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 to the user? So I want to control that, but at the same time, I realize that in the current ecosystem, I need to have a Google Assistant, I need to have Alexa, I need to have them available through my assistant, so that all of those uh, interesting services that we have seen there, all of them are available to, to my users. Any questions from the audience? We've covered a lot of ground here, but uh, either you're in need of coffee or, or but anyway, well, let's continue this a little bit more. We've got a little bit more time. Um, one of the things that's happened in voice is a transition from speech recognition to what's called natural language understanding now. And following on from that, there's going to be this speech to meaning, which is far more like AI than, than ever we've seen this stuff before. Um, and included in that is the potential for uh, you to have sentiment analysis, which is becoming possible now because you've got the power of the cloud being applied to something that's so it's not in the set-top box. But the set-top box is just a means to get it out to the cloud. Um, it, do you think recommendations will be better if you have sentiment analysis as part of the, the speech function <coughs> as such that you can tell, it's a, first of all, it's, it's, it's the woman in the household, or you can tell she's a bit tired, or you can tell it's a the teenager, and you can tell it's a, uh, he or she is a bit excited. Is that something that you see in the future development in that AI, in that vein, that's going to make the user experience that much better? In Holland, England? Yeah, or I, for, I, for, I foresee indeed, because we have been talking about personalization for a long time. Uh, when you are talking about personalization, to do that on the UI is quite complicated. It's not very user friendly. So with the introduction of voice services, that could be an enabler for doing more personalization in the home. Uh, so maybe searching a recommendation will become more personal uh, with a voice assistance because it's 
really straightforward to uh, recognize someone when uh, he's speaking or she's speaking to the TV set. How do you see it, uh, John, for instance? Do you see that some of the requirements coming from your customers needing that more sophisticated kind of interaction with the, with the consumer? Not to that kind of level. I mean, I, th I think we're getting in a little bit, as far as I'm concerned, a bit of science fiction there. I mean, the idea of coming home and groaning at the, <laughs> at the telly and saying that you want to watch uh, Coronation Street and saying, you know, uh, here's a scotch. Calm down. Is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, what, that's, I mean, what that's what these guys in AI are talking about. And, I mean, and suddenly, that, suddenly the fridge it. opens and you know something nice comes out. Um, no, we, we, we're, we're trying to help um, a pretty pressurised pay TV market do the right things properly at the moment, which is um, you know trying to get decent content to as many devices as they can. But as I said, you know in a a reliable fashion. So, you know, going back to HDR, um, that's um, cert, you know useful for higher ARPU markets, particularly the US. But if you know Anthony was talking about the first uh, you know 4K box in Africa, I mean that's a big thing to happen. But between those two stools are you know a huge amount of um, reliability and consistency and trying to find search and discovery to try and, you know, this morning we talked, we, we saw an awful lot about advertising and a lot of rich content. Well, in our business, we've got to try and make sure that that's reliable and happens in a, in a very um, clean way to make money for our customers. Any questions from the audience? We've, we've I guess we've put them to sleep, but uh, um, one last then, uh, Anthony, do you want to answer that question? Because you do have some high-end devices uh, that are services serving yeah. in, a, in a high ARPU market, right? Yeah, I, 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 I guess I, I tend to agree. I mean, that's, that's kind of out there, but what, what we consider out there today, what may happen in six or nine months, um, it, it may, may astonish us. You know, I, I, predicting the future, I think, is something that uh, we all wish we could, uh, we could do, but uh, none of us are very good at. Um, I would just say that you know I think we're very passionate about the capabilities that voice brings. I think we're just at the beginning of it. I mentioned one use case, and what others were mentioned in terms of the facility of search, the possibilities of uh, of voice, including recognizing uh, the voice, knowing who's who's talking, potentially knowing how they're feeling. Sure, I mean I think that technology is not miles away, and yes, that will you know when we look at the magnitude of choice that you have when you turn on your television. You know, having some things um, uh, recommended to you based on how you are feeling or, or uh, the sound of your voice. It sounds like science fiction maybe, but uh, I think you'd, we'd all be surprised. So see you in, in two or three years. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that question, I guess, uh, see where we're at. I know. I, I didn't think this time last year I'd get an email from my sprinkler system for sure. <laughs> anyway, with that, if there's any other questions, no, we'll close this session. You can go get coffee. Please thank the panel. Thank you.